Well, thanks for uh, joining us tonight at the Commonwealth Club. It's really fun to see all of you out there and to be sitting down with you, Katrina Lake. Um, so a few fun facts about you that you already know, but those of you in the audience may not already know. Um, you grew up in San Francisco. Round of applause for local girl. <laughs> and Minnesota. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Minnesotans out there support that? Yeah, all right. Uh, you became the youngest female founder and CEO to take a company public just in November 2017. And you did it on stage at the NASDAQ with your young son on your hip, which created a few double takes, which we will talk about. <laughs> Um, and seven years after you received your first term sheet, Stitch Fix, an online styling company, is valued at more than $2 billion, with a B, <laughs> and a two. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> so tonight, we'll get to know a bit more about you and how you've done all this. But I have to make a confession before we really get into it, which is that I had to change my clothes like 14 times before I got here. <laughs> I did too. It's OK. <laughs> I don't know about all of you, but it was really hard to decide what to wear, especially when sitting down with a fashion entrepreneur such as yourself. So well, you um, look great. <laughs> well, thank you. So do you. And so do all of you. You look amazing. Um, but it made me start thinking about what the role of clothing is for women and men, and the way that we think about it and how it, you know, says who we are. And I'm curious what what your thoughts are on what. You know, your entire business is around making sure that people are wearing stuff that they look good and are comfortable in. So what, how do you think about the role of clothing? Yeah, it was a, it was a major point of inspiration for me, um, and I think two different angles. So one, like people, there are so few other categories where people really thoughtfully, like, you know, think about like, oh, I, I'm coveting this and I want this. And, I, and you think about something for weeks and you get inspired by it. And I mean, there's so few other categories. Food is probably one of them also, where you think kind of this, you have the same emotional connection to it. But with clothing, it's just one of these things that, um, you know, is so important in people's lives and, and not in a materialistic way, but in this way that like, you know, you thoughtfully decide every day what you're going to put on your body. And that means something. Um, and so I think that made it very attractive to me because I think it's just this really interesting, huge category that, um, you know, people weren't really thinking about what does technology bring to it and what's the next generation of it. Um, and then I think the, yeah, you know, I think the second element that you're getting to a little bit is that like, it, it really does have an impact on who you are. And, um, and I know this, and I mean, this was shared recently, but I'm now, I don't know, four or five months pregnant or I'm in that phase where you were like chubby, but not pregnant right, nothing yet. Fits. Congratulations. And, and nothing fits. <laughs> and it's and it's you know and it's a, such a good reminder of the humility of like how um, how much I really appreciate when I have clothes that fit and when I know what I want to wear every day and um, and the reality is you know if you're if you're feeling great about who you are if you're feeling confident about who you are um, it it really does impact all the touch points in your day and I think all of us know that feeling of when you're not quite feeling that way or the flip side is when you are and um, and you know I think how electric that can be and how in all these little micro moments in your day, it can change your life of, you know, how kind you are to somebody, how kind you are to your kids, like, you know, how, um, how outgoing you're going to be, um, how confident you are when you're at work doing something that's really important. Um, and so, you know, the, for all those reasons, I love that apparel was, you know, both super meaningful in people's lives. And I think in these really like small, but meaningful ways has an impact in people's lives every single day. What do you, like, when you imagine the future of fashion, like, do, do you have, is there a scene that you create? Like, is there something that you see out there that we can expect, you know, in the next 10, I don't know, 100 years? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> less about, you know, I think less about fashion. And to me, fashion is the ethereal, like, amazing art part of the business. And, I mean, I think about more of the practical day-to-day, -day, like, I just want to have clothes that I'm excited to wear. Yeah. Like, and um, and I, I think that there has to be change in the way that people that people discover that today. And so today, you know, I think it's with, with Stitch Fix for people who aren't familiar with Stitch Fix. Um, the way that we work is that we are retail, we are online, but 100% of what we sell is through personal stylists. So there's no e-commerce site. You can't come to the site and filter for white jeans and see what we have. Um, this is your you know your fate is entirely in the hands of our stylists. And that makes our business smarter, potentially harder. Um, and it makes it easier actually 
especially for you as a consumer. And it's really linked to like what I think the future of shopping is going to be. And if you think today, like if you did want white jeans, then um, what are you going to do today? You can go spend a whole day at a mall. You can pick, you know, your 10 favorite retailers and go to all of their websites and filter for white jeans on every single one and look at the clothing on the model and figure out how tall the model is and see what the inseam is and try to learn as much as you can about every single white jean on the planet to try to figure out which one is best for me when I'm five foot two and not my normal size. And like, it's just like an absurd, you know, there are people, our stylists um, who love doing this for people every single day. And most of us don't love that every single day. And most of us don't necessarily love the fashion part. All we want is to like look great and have clothes in our closet that we love to wear. Um, and so, you know, I think the idea of like everybody doing their own research and um, a world of search, like, I just think this is not going to be the future. And I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, remember those days when you used to like buy stuff from all kinds of different retailers and ship it all in different sizes and try it all on at home? And I mean, we're going to look back and think about like how broken retail was because there's a better way. And, you know, I hope Stitch Fix is, you know, at the forefront of that and can continue to be at the forefront of that. Do you, as the head of this company, do you ever feel like you know, all, all eyes are on you and what are you wearing? I mean, does you ever feel the pressure to like look good all the time? I probably don't think about it as much as I should. <laughs> That's probably a healthy answer, actually. So what was happening in your life when you came up with the idea for Stitch Fix? So it's hard to say exactly when I came up with the idea, but, um, you know, some, I guess some history, like I growing up, like, you know, as a 10 year old, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you a doctor. Like it had never occurred to me that I should, or I should want to be an entrepreneur, that I would be a good entrepreneur. You know, you take all these, I forget what they're called, like a Myers-Briggs test. You know, you take these tests when you're growing up and like zero of them told me I should be an entrepreneur. Um, Is that even an answer? Like, I'm not even sure if that's an answer. They, they need to update that test. Yeah, it was. And I, and I think, I mean, it's really interesting because I think a lot of the things that you think about as an entrepreneur, you think somebody who's like super risky and somebody who's, um, you know, going to stay up for all hours, like tinkering with something in their garage and like, um, and not that I didn't spend all hours doing such fix at some point, but, um, you know, I don't think that I had like the typical traits of an entrepreneur. Um, and my, like my mom was a public school teacher here in San Francisco for a long time. My dad was a doctor, but always in the university system. He was here at UCSF for probably over for 20 years or so. Um, and so, you know, there's not like an entrepreneurial bone in my body. And so my journey was a little bit of an unconventional one where I, um, I worked at a consulting firm. I did that kind of out of indecision because I, w I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I wasn't ready to do that yet. And so I worked at a consulting firm and was lucky enough to kind of stumble into the retail and restaurant practice. And that's where both retail and restaurant I love because I was like, they're just these big, meaningful categories. And so, you know, the journey was more like I wanted, I love those categories. And I was like, and I want to work at whatever is going to be the future. And I spent a bunch of time looking to join that company. And so I interviewed a bunch of places. I almost took a job at Starbucks. Um, ultimately, like, didn't quite feel like that was exactly it. And then I worked at a venture capital firm thinking, okay, this is going to be a great way for me to meet the person who's going to create the future. And so I went and met with, you know, 100 entrepreneurs in my two years there um, and, you know, didn't meet the person that I thought was going to be the future of retail, but got to meet, you know, 100 people who were all like, pretty normal people who were not qualified to be an entrepreneur. And, <laughs> um, and I realized that like, you know, any person could be this. And I think, you know, you get exposed to the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Steve Jobs of the world. And, you know, you don't have in your frame of reference, that could be me. Yeah. And, you know, by meeting a hundred people, you meet a lot of different types of people. And so I realized I could do it. And so, um, you know, I think I, I was really on this journey of, I just want to work at whatever company is reinventing retail in the future. And, um, and the formation of Stitch Fix was really just realizing that like, if I believe there is a different future out there, like I could start it. Um, just create it, just make your own future. So that's, yeah, that was that. the beginning. <laughs> So were you, were you always a shopper? I mean, you know, from, from an intellectual standpoint, it was interesting to you, but in terms of your own personal, you know, was that something that you either hated doing or loved doing or? Um, I, 
Maybe both. I don't. It's, I, I have a sister actually who's here. Um, she's not the shopper either. But, <laughs> um, we have a the sister who's the Asian between us. She she was a shopper, and so um, you know she was the one who was definitely always the expert. She was always the one taking the fashion risks. And um, Natalie and I were probably more of the followers and taking our hand me downs. Um, but um, but I still you know what I still loved and what I think. People, even people who hate shopping can resonate with is like, there is nothing better than being able to feel like you have clothes in your closet that you love. And there is nothing better than putting on an outfit and being like, this is a great look. Like there is nothing better than that feeling. And so, um, you know, I think I, you know, I really love that. And I love the ways that, that, that clothing could contribute to that. Um, but no, I'm not, you know, like my, my other, my middle sister literally will like, she, she would spend her free time looking at like the new arrivals on websites and like, that's not really how I spend my free time. <laughs> <laughs> so now you just have a company that has a combination of machines and people doing that for, for you. Right. For well, and I think that's part of the inspiration, yep. too, is that, like, there are people who love doing this and who are experts and know everything and in their free time love to do this. And wouldn't it be great to be able to create a job for people like that? And so, you know, that actually ended up being part of the inspiration, too. Yeah. So um, how important was going to business school in creating this idea? So for me, it was important because, um, like, I wasn't this super risky entrepreneur type who was gonna, like, I was never gonna quit my reasonably well-paying job and like have a gap on my resume. Like that was just not in, um, that was not something I was comfortable doing. And so um, for me, it was important because it created this two-year period of time where I could take this risk. And so I went to business school, and my plan was to have a company off the ground, paying myself a salary, paying back my student loans. The day I graduated. And if I wasn't able to have a business idea that was good enough that someone was going to give me money, if I wasn't able to have an idea that I wanted to do so that I would you know, want to spend so far seven plus years on, um, then you know, the worst case scenario is like, well, I have this MBA and I can go work at a great company. And so you know, I saw it as kind of a risk reduced way to start a company. And so you know, for me, it was really important because I, I have a hard time imagining how else I would have been able to find kind of a two year time period like that. Um, but you know, I think it, there's a network element that's somewhat valuable. The classes were great. It's just, it's so fun to, it's, you know, I think kind of like probably the reason many of you are in this room, like getting to be an adult and go and learn is just like really fun experience and getting to choose what you're going to learn. And, um, you know, so I definitely valued the experience, but the time was actually the part that I think was, that was most valuable to me. Well, I'd love to talk a little bit more about this idea of risk, because I think people do, you, you, you mentioned this a few minutes ago, that people have this idea in their head that entrepreneurs are these massive risk takers, and they, you know, anything goes, and I, I'm sorry, and, and, and like, in fact, I saw a, a book just earlier today that said, how to raise an entrepreneur, and it was like, teach them to take risks, you know, like all these things that just go counter to what the actual common wisdom is about how you start a successful business, which is not necessarily to just you know, let it all fly. So can, can you can you talk about your mentality around that and, and what you've run up against in terms of the perception of what an entrepreneur should be? Yeah, I, I mean, it is interesting because, I, and I wonder, and, you know, I don't even know that. So first of all, like, I, you know, I think I am a good leader and a good CEO. And I don't know necessarily that I was a great entrepreneur, to be honest. And, you know, maybe people think of, I mean, I don't know, like, I just, I wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't kind of, where my comfort zone was, like, I don't sit back and you'll meet some founders who get to this stage of the company and they yearn the scrappy phases again. And they just, they, you know, they like the building part. Like you'll hear that from people. And, um, and I, you know, I did like it and it was really fun and crazy. Um, but you know, I don't know that that's the part that I feel like I thrive in. And, you know, we'll probably talk about this later, but like, you could also argue that I wasn't good at it. Like, you know, we, we've built a, $2 billion company using 40 million of capital, not because I was like, oh, I want to raise as much as little money as possible. Like it was because I could not raise more than that much money. <laughs> and so <laughs> if, you know, in today's world, a good entrepreneur is the one that can raise the most money and hire the most people and buy the most time. And like, you could argue I wasn't good at those things. And, you know, ultimately was actually good at creating a company, which is maybe different. But, um, so, you know, I, I hope to be able to be a, ro a role model of a different type of entrepreneur entrepreneur, because I think there are lots of women and men out there that, you know, might be thinking to themselves like, well, that's, you know, that's not for me. Like, I can't see myself being that 
crazy out there person. And, um, and I felt the same way. And I think ultimately, like, I actually think I'm good at this job. And I don't know that I would have discovered it had it not been for kind of the convoluted path that I took. Mm. Well, what, I mean, when you, when you talk about Stitch Fix, I've heard it talked about as a fashion company, a technology company, the intersection of fashion and technology. And, um, which, which, what, what, what is it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it is both. And I mean, my theory on the whole thing is just like, I think the world is, we are going to a place where like being a technology company will be table stakes for you to exist. And, you know, the idea of a tech company doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like I think Facebook is a marketing company. Uber is a transportation company. Airbnb is a hospitality company. And we sell clothes. Like that is our business model. And I think the reality is like if you want to be around 10 years from now, if you want to be successful 10 years from now, all of us are going to have to be technology companies. Um, So technology is certainly, you know, what is differentiated about Stitch Fix, what is, um, I think, what is very special about Stitch Fix. Um, But at the end of the day, like the business that we're in is retail apparel. Um, and I think more and more we'll see other companies, um, like actually I just heard that on the analyst side, on the investor side, that Tesla has now been moved into the auto category for most, which makes sense. They make they cars. Make cars. <laughs> <laughs> Where were they before? They, they were, were in technology. Uh-huh. And so there's this weird catch-all yeah. bucket of people who've used technology as a differentiator that like, I think you're going to see more and more of that migrate back into, um, you know, right. And even Stitch Fix is a stock, like we're covered by Mo- mostly tech people actually, and then a couple of retail people. And, you know, I think you'll see more and more people recognizing that like, hey, these businesses are like, you know, they're the same businesses they were before, just powered by technology in a way that we didn't see before. So, um, so you know, I think we're both, but I think the marcation 10 years from now will probably be retail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like when automation became a thing that like every, everyone was making widgets. Oh, my mic has gone up. <laughs> Everyone was making widgets, but it was powered by this automation on the back end. And so maybe now we'll finally get back to just what are the widgets instead of how is it made? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you had you had these big goals for yourself coming out of business school. Um, did, did you meet them right right away? I mean, you, you wanted to pay yourself a salary. You wanted to have a sustainable business. Um, not right away, but I was. Um, I mean, I really wasn't going to do this if I wasn't paying myself a salary and paying back my student loans. Like that wasn't just like a, a, that wasn't an empty promise. Like I really wasn't going to do it. Um, and so, um, I was very committed. And so I was, I spent a lot of my second year in business school out here. Um, I spent probably a week or so a month, um, and, um, like sleeping on people's couches and like, (laughs) um, and, um, they, and so I was able to get a term sheet from Steve Anderson, who is a seed investor, who is one of the first investors. I saw Kevin on the sizzle reel. He was, Kevin was actually my, um, like a reference check for Steve, the investor. He was the first investor in Kevin at Instagram. Um, and so I was lucky enough to kind of meet him early on. And so he gave us, you know, what would now be considered a very small seed check of a half million dollars. Um, and so we closed that in April of 2011, um, started shipping fixes in that month. Um, and then I graduated in May and then kind of moved everything out here in June. Um, and so, you know, maybe I guess we closed the money a month before I graduated. So maybe I got in just under the wire. We didn't have a sustainable business model yet at that point, but, um, but, you know, I was able to pay myself a salary, pay rent, um, you know, hire some people. And so, um, you know, I think, and I, and I think the other part that was important to me too, and the investor thing was, yes, it was important to raise money, but I think it's also important to have, um, somebody who believes in you invested in the business. And so there's a lot of, um, I think confidence and credibility that comes from the fact that an investor who's met a lot of entrepreneurs and seen a lot of companies believes in the business. And, you know, I think one of the things that you can do as an entrepreneur is delude yourself into really, really believing in something. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes it's not reality. And so, you know, having investors involved, I think also helps um, to, you know, to build confidence that like this this thing is real and it's possible. Mm-hmm. How, how many no's did you have to hear before he said yes? Um, I mean, he was, the seed was relatively easy, I would say, of just like, I think fundraising at Stitch Fix has always been either really hard or really easy and nothing in the middle. <laughs> um, and um, with him, like he, 
I had worked with this woman, Sukinder Singh Cassidy, who had been an advisor of mine and a mentor of mine, and she introduced me to him. And, um, and so, you know, that part worked out well, but basically he was like, he gave a term sheet for, um, $750,000. He was going to put in 500 and he said, go find whoever else to fill in the rest of the 250. And so I probably talked to, I don't know, 20 or so people and everybody else said no. And I was very freaked out that like, is he going to get cold feet when I go back to him and say nobody else wanted to? And, you know, he actually said, and I think he meant it. He was like, I'm glad that nobody else did. I'm happy to put in the other quarter million. And I was like, great. That's amazing. Um, and so, um, you know, he was like, I, it just makes me even happier to see something when people, other people don't see it is kind of the way he put it. And so, um, and so that, that round we got done later rounds, I think were a little bit more difficult. What, what, did he tell you what it was he saw? I mean, what it was that made him believe in you? I mean, at that stage, you know, anybody can come up with this idea. Like anybody can come up. It's, and Stitch Fix has this great product market fit because like when you tell people, like, wouldn't it be great if you could fill out a style profile and have a stylist who would send things to your home and then you can try things on at home and just pay for what you keep. Like the concept is so strong itself that, you know, I think we benefit from having a lot of just natural product market fit from it. But the flip side of that is anybody can think of that and anybody can pitch that to an investor. Um, and so, you know, I think with Steve, it was really about like, you know, am I going to be the right person to do it? And, um, and honestly, like I had no experience that should have led him to believe that I was credible. Like I had no entrepreneurial experience whatsoever. I had, you know, no network of engineers and whoever else to draw from. Um, but you know, for whatever reason, he felt like I was going to be the one to be able to do it. Well, con congratulations to him and to you <laughs> <laughs> for that. Um, so I'm curious about, um, well, I, I want to go back to you maybe being a doctor at some point when you were 10. <laughs> um, so I understand that your mom came to America from Japan to go to graduate school. Um, did that, did that sort of, I don't know, did she have that immigrant mentality of like, my daughter must achieve absolutely everything to, you know, live up to the expectations of our, of our new American family? Or, I mean, did you run into any of that as gr growing up? Um, I'm looking at my sister. <laughs> I don't know really that we, you know, I, I definitely don't think Keep she was, um, <laughs> um, you know, she definitely, I think academics were very important in my family. Like both, both of my parents really believe that um, succeeding in school, that um, having you know, having a great education would open doors. Um, and so I think that element was definitely very much ingrained. And um, in growing up, my mom was from, my mom immigrated here from Japan for graduate school. Um, and I, and so we spoke Japanese growing up. And so in San Francisco, there is, um, there are schools you can go to so that you can keep up with the Japanese curriculum because J Japan has a national curriculum and um, so every um, so every Saturday until I was in seventh grade, I think every single Saturday and then every day in the summer, I went to Japanese school. So I had, you know, I mean, that's like a lot of days of school. If you think about that is, did you of, of 365 <laughs> days, like the vast, vast, vast majority of them were spent. I basically had every Sunday off. That's right. So that's I had 52 days school. off of school in a year. Did you resent that? <laughs> um, well, I, I didn't, you know, I don't, I, yes. <laughs> the reality is like, I, I wasn't, there wasn't like anything better that I should have been doing. So, um, but, and I don't know, it's, it was so funny too, cause it was in the nineties. And so, you know, everybody thought J Japanese was going to be so useful and, <laughs> um, and it's still useful when I'm in Japan or occasionally in a Japanese restaurant in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it wasn't quite the business unlock people thought it would be. Um, it's not over yet. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I guess, so it's more just like, you know, I do feel like they instilled um, the importance of education in us. And so, you know, we definitely worked hard in school and definitely um, liked succeeding in school. Um, and then the, and I think they're also, I think, on the family side, like I was very, I don't think I've realized this until kind of as a, being a, an adult and actually really in the last few years, but I, I had these, exp I had a lot of exposure to women in my family who'd done amazing things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, part of it is my mom, like, you know, immigrating here and, you know, not knowing English and, um, and she didn't learn to drive until she was like, she, until she'd had two kids 
in San Francisco. And she was like, well, the bus isn't going to work anymore and I have to figure out how to drive. And so, you know, I mean, all of that is kind of amazing. And then um, the longer story is like her. So my mother's mom, so my grandmother was actually the one who really desperately wanted to be an American. And so she had grown up in Japan at a time when um, she was like a lot. She grew up during the war um, when Japan was in a very difficult place. And she um, and she just always dreamed that like she would see American movies or posters or God knows what the influences were, but she just desperately wanted to be an American. And she was growing up at a time when like women weren't driving, where they had very little opportunity. She was in an arranged marriage. Um, and, you know, and it's, and she actually ultimately did follow my mom after my mom moved here. She followed my mom here and she did actually ultimately become an American. And it's like an amazing thing to think that like, you know, it, it's, of all the things that you think are hard in life, like to live, if you imagine like growing up in Japan in that moment and being able to think to yourself, like someday I'm going to be an American and make that happen is like yeah. amazing. Um, and then the other one is on my American side, actually on my, or my Caucasian side, my, um, my great grandmother. So it was my grandfather. My grandfather was raised in this very unusual household where my grandfather was um, basically his mom and her sister both lost their husbands. And this was before welfare. It was before there were social services that were available. And so what these two sisters did was they were, they were like, well, like, we're just going to create a household. Like, I think they had, I need a fact check. I think they had five, they had four or five kids between them. And they were like, we're just going to combine our households. And one of us is going to go to work and the other one is going to stay home with the kids and, wow. and two sisters are going to raise these kids together. And so my grandfather was the youngest of those. And so he had been raised by these two strong women. He'd never even known his dad. And so like to be able to have these examples in your life of like people doing, you know, anything that I achieve is never going to be as amazing as the things that they did. And um, it's just a great example to be able to have in your life because I think it opens up kind of what's possible in a way that is, you know, I really appreciate. Yeah. Well, did that, do you think that that changed his worldview? It totally did. I mean, my grandfather was the one, he like taught me to use a computer. He taught me to drive. Like, you know, I look back now and I can recognize those things as being really cool things that he did. Yeah. But like, I think he just, he came from a place where like, oh yeah, of course, like women are going to do these amazing things. And of course my like, you know, three granddaughters are going to do like whatever they want to do and learn how to do the stuff on a computer. And, you know, I mean, it was just, he definitely had a different perspective than I think a lot of people in his generation did. Yeah. Oh, wow. What a, what a great, what a great place to come from. <laughs> yeah. But now you have to be setting that example, right? You do feel, I mean, do you ever feel like you have these sort of unrealistic expectations? I mean, it's, it's, but you know, it's a great, it's, I think it's an amazing thing to be able to feel like, you know, that there are just these examples of people that like, there's no way that anything I do can be as amazing as they did. And I'm just lucky to be somewhere in that lineage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet if I ask them, they'd probably say, there's no way I could do anything as amazing as <laughs> I'm sure it goes both ways. Um, so what, I mean, just thinking about uh, how, like, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a new business? Like, what's the one thing that you wish you had known that just nobody bothered to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> or the 10 things. There's probably more. Um, oh, God, there's so many. Um, you know, I think I, there's a bunch of things. Like, I think one, like, this is a very permanent decision. And um, so as much as you can do of, like, learning and validating along the way, I think is really valuable because, um, like, I do think there are times when you can delude yourself into, like, well, it's just one more product change and then everybody's going to love it. Or it's just one th other thing. And like, you know, I think the more you can really get like concrete points of validation, and I think it's called like lean startup now, which is basically like try to build a shell of what you're going to create and then see if people like it. What do they like about it? And then iterate from there rather than trying to have like a build it and they will come approach. Um, so, you know, I think that's definitely a big one. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, I just, this is my personal philosophy, but I, I don't believe in entrepreneurship for the sake of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, you devote a lot of time and energy and a lot of your life to this and like you really have to love it. And um, and so not to sound like I'm discouraging entrepreneurship, but I think, you know, really making sure you have that like one thing that you really want to devote a lot of your life to, um, you know, I think, I don't know, people can rush to imperfect ideas and I don't know. So I think that's one thing. Um, and the last I think is just like surround yourself with people who are smart that you learn from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true if you're an entrepreneur or just a regular person in your career like I was. Um, and, you know, I think there, 
to be able to surround yourself with people who challenge you, to be able to feel like, you know, I mean, there's nothing worse than stasis and staying the same. Like I try to figure, I like, it's a hard thing actually these days and how, um, how little I think we get exposed to other perspectives these days. But if you try to think about like, when was the last time I really changed my mind about something important? Like it's, it's a hard question to answer. And, you know, I love being proven wrong. And at work, I get proven wrong probably more than anywhere else. <laughs> um, and, um, and I learn from it. And it's, I mean, the only way that you grow is, is through learning. And so, um, you know, I think that's just the best advice of like, as you're building a team, as you're building a board, as you're thinking about your advisors of just really holding the bar high for like people who are going to challenge you, people that you're going to learn from, um, and people that are going to help you to keep, stay on this really steep learning curve. Did you, was there ever an idea that you had that you just thought was brilliant and then it just <laughs> fell flat on its face? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't start a lot of things before I started this. <laughs> or even um, within, I mean, within, within Stitch Fix. Well, within Stitch Fix, like there are definitely, you know, one example that I'll pick is, so um, lots of venture capitalists would tell us like your onboarding, your style profile is too long. Like people are not going to fill out the whole thing and you should take questions out of it and you should improve conversion. And so um, we, we were like, okay, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And so we figured out what are the three or four questions that like aren't as important as the other ones and let's remove those from the style profile. And what you would expect is that conversion would go up, that more people would fill out the sur survey because you know if it was 30 questions before and now it's 27 questions, it takes a shorter amount of time. And, and the crazy thing was it depends on the question, but sometimes conversion would go down. And you're like, this is fewer questions, this is less work. And the reason is because if I don't ask you like your preferences on denim, like if I don't ask you what silhouettes of denim that you like, you don't trust me that I'm gonna be able to send you ones that you like. And so I'm actually losing trust in the process so that by the time you get to the payment page, you're like, I, I don't think I want to do this because like, I'm not sure that they're actually going to be able to get me in this. And so um, that's like a really good example where we learn something that's like pretty counterintuitive. Another one is markdowns, like just being in retail, like you think, you know, it, you think, okay, if something's not working, we'll just mark it 30% off and then it'll work. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've tested it because it's like hard for me to even believe the results, even though they're A-B tested and robust. And the reality is like, I'm better off sending you a hundred dollar dress that fits you, that you love than sending you a dress that's marked down to $60 that doesn't fit you right. And like, and it's a hard thing for us to all wrap our head around. And at the same time, I do this too. Like I can think of the things in my closet that I bought on sale because it seemed like a great deal. And, you know, I thought maybe I'd wear it. And the reality is I was better off not buying that and buying something else for full price. And like, we have the data to show it yeah. and, and, and I still can't wrap my head around it. Like it just doesn't <laughs> seem right, but yeah. it is. So. Yeah, no, that's so true. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really great, I think that's a good take home lesson, actually. <laughs> You're going to save us all a lot of money. Okay. Um, so you, you know, as, as the CEO of a public company, it's, it's kind of this high wire act, like almost anything you say could affect the share price. And you don't necessarily even know what that thing is going to be, right? So everyone's listening all the time. And I'm wondering, like, as you think about the, you know, the values that you want to instill in the company and what's important to you and where your priorities are, how do you you know, how do you balance that sort of like, we got to pay attention to what the shareholders want versus we got to pay attention to what's right for the company. And maybe sometimes they don't always match up. Yeah. I mean, I might have like a Pollyanna view on it and maybe we're early to this. We've been, you know, public for three quarters, but like, I really believe that what the right thing is going to be for the shareholders is also going to be what's right for the company. And, um, and, you know, I think I don't look at the stock price on a daily basis, you know, for better or for worse. I don't know what the fluctuations are or what causes them. Um, the long term, where we go in the long term is, is definitely important. And, um, and I think a lot of the things that we do are really looking at how can we, how can we make sure that we can create the most value um, for ourselves, for our shareholders, for our clients. Um, and you know, I think the other brilliant thing about like our model that I love is that there's this amazing alignment. And so, um, and you know, if you think about like in our business model, um, the more I can send you clothes that you love, the happier you are and the better our business is. And so there's this like really, really great alignment that you don't always have. Like if you think about Google's business model, for example, like the more ads they can show, the more 
ads they can get people to click on, like the better their business is. And like as a consumer, like you don't really want to see all the ads. You just want to use Gmail. And so like there's this interesting, I think, you know, kind of dance that a lot of executives have to walk of just like what's good for the business versus what's good for the customer. And I have this like amazing advantage where it's very aligned in a lot of cases. And so like it helps us in prioritizing because, you know, if we can just focus on how can we help people to find what they love and how can we help people to find more of what they love? And um, like, it just makes it really clear of like what we need to do to create value. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that they are the same thing and that, you know, we won't have to feel like a lot of conflict of short term versus long term. But, um, but, you know, I think so far we've been, you know, talk, when we talk to investors and you spend time with investors and it is actually in a lot of ways, just like being a private company, like they're investors that I can talk to at certain times and hear their perspectives. And, um, and, you know, I think it's my job to make sure that everybody knows what that long-term vision is and, um, and to, you know, to make sure that people all see it and believe it. Well, it sounds like you've surrounded yourself with a great team that come from a variety of big brand backgrounds and Netflix and Google and I don't know, Lululemon was in there somewhere. And um, do you have a do you have a mentor? Like, do you have that one person that you can turn to and be like, I can't ask anyone else this question. I mean, do you, and if you don't, do you feel like you would like to? No, I mean, I roll that. I I do, and I think, and I've had many throughout my journey, and I would say I have di I have different people that I turn to for different topics. And so, um, it, actually, one of the things that I think has been really um, fun and un unexpected about being a public company was that like I. It's not like I had lots of public company CEOs that I knew. Like, you know, I had met a couple. <laughs> like, I really didn't know any. And um, it was really amazing how people kind of came out of the woodwork and helped. Like, there was, like, our, um, you know, now it's all water, water under the bridge, but our roadshow process, the process of getting public was, like, it was difficult. It's, like, in the bucket of when I say fundraising has either been really hard or really easy. And the IPO process was really hard. And, um, you know, we weren't kind of seeing the traction that we wanted to see. We weren't. Um, you know, getting people bought into the story in the way that we needed to. And so, um, and I had like a public company CEO who through an investment banker was like, hey, if she needs to talk, tell her to call me. And it was somebody I'd never met before who had been through the process and kind of knew exactly how I was feeling in that moment. And um, and there's been other, I think others also who've kind of reached out since. And so um, I've been really, you know, I think that was a network that I didn't necessarily knew existed and where I didn't feel like I was part of it before that just kind of emerged to be helpful. That's been great. Um, but, you know, I think I have uh, my board, actually, I have a lot of great people on my board who I turn to a lot. Um, and, I'll, and over the course of the last seven years, I've been lucky enough to kind of build a network of, in a lot of cases, other CEOs, people who are in the space and not in the space who, um, you know, who have, who are going through similar things that, you know, I can talk to and get advice from. And, um, and, you know, I think I've been very fortunate that there are a lot of, um, women that I've met also along the way who like are very happy to make time for me whenever I ask. And so, you know, it's certainly something that I hope to be able to repay the favor for. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's my next question is how, what, what are the ways in which you can now in the position that you're in pay it forward? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, unfortunately I can't do it in all the ways that I would like to, but, <laughs> I um, who has I was, the time? It's, yeah. it's really funny. I was actually just talking to my husband about it today, but I think in the last, um, in the last two days, I think I've or in the last three days, I've done four calls with kind of entrepreneurs or CEOs or meetings. And, um, you know, and, and so I, um, you know, I definitely do try to pay it forward that way. Um, and, you know, I think also I, ha I, I think there are ways that I am paying it forward just by um, the role that I'm in and what Stitch Fix has, has been able to do. And so, um, you know, while I am proud of being the youngest founder CEO to take a company public, like, I'm not that young. I'm 35 years old. Like, I hope somebody will dethrone me quickly. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think there's, um, there's still, you know, there's still a lot more to come. Well, what, what do you look for? Because I know you're involved. You're involved in a, a, a few things that are female focused in terms of investments, and um, I've got the female investment fund, something called Moving Forward, mm -hmm. um, which is about diversity. But but in terms of when you now look at other companies that are looking for investments, um, what do you look for? What do I look for? I mean, I don't do a ton of investing, but I mean, it is really important to me that um, founders that I meet and, and kind of companies I'm involved in are committed to building diverse teams. 
Um, and I mean that, you know, that has a women angle, but I think it's much broader than a women angle of like, I think one of the things that Stitch Fix that has made the company great is, <clears throat> is the diversity of team and perspectives that we have. And so the fact that we have data scientists who are sitting next to stylists and being like, why are you picking that one? Wait, why did you not pick that one? I don't understand what's going on in your mind. And they're just fascinated and really have this great respect for the job that they do. And I think, you know, part of what's amazing about Stitch Fix is that I don't know that there's ever been like a data scientist who sat down with a stylist and like got into their brain <laughs> about why they're choosing clothes. And so, um, you know, I think we've really benefited from um, the diversity of people and perspectives that we have. And I think it's really important for founders to start with that. And I think one of the bigger challenges of why we have we see so little diversity at the top and at technology companies is because so often founding teams are built by repeat founders who go back to their network to build the team. And so they're just perpetuating this kind of lack of diversity that has existed in the industry for 20 years. And so, um, you know, when you see and, you know, no one's putting up a job posting for a co-founder. Like, you know, you're just drawing from people in your network. And so um, so I think, you know, as I have the chance to meet with founding teams, like, I push on it a lot. I push on it with their board. I push on it with, um, you know, I've noticed you don't have any women on your founding team. What is your commitment on that? And so, um, so you know, I think that's an area that I think helps to make companies better and I, I think also kind of creates a better ecosystem for all of us. Well, you're, you are, we, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of this, the, the, the iconic photo of you with the NASDAQ with your son uh, on your hip. And um, it was a head turner, you know, and, and, and people, as, as many photos as there have been taken of male CEOs with their kid, you know, also in the picture, yours is the one that people talk about. <laughs> so so the, this next question is sort of like about running a company while female, <laughs> you know. Um, are, you, are you tired of headlines that focus on taking your company public and being a new mom? Or just recently there was a headline, Stitch, Stitch Fix CEO Katrina Lake talks about leading a public company and her upcoming maternity leave. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I can see the pros and cons, right? Like, we are female. We are capable of making babies. We are who will be perpetrating the rest of the human race. Like, we, you know, we need, we need to be in the mix here. But we'd also like to be running companies. So I'm just curious, what is your point of view on, you know, that, like, I had, you know, no offense to Refinery29, where the headline came from, but the, the, that those two things are together. Um, I mean, so I, my perspective on it has changed over time. So I, I was almost like prickly about being a female CEO in the early days. And, um, you know, I thought, I think it was at a time when, you know, you would see companies like Dropbox and Airbnb and whatever else. And like, I was like, I just want to be like a CEO and I don't need to be a female CEO and I don't need to be the female CEO. Um, and you know, I think I, I had some pride about me, I think that prevented me from embracing that early. Um, and now and you know, this is more on reflection of like looking back and thinking like, well, why did I not think I could be an entrepreneur? And now I just think it's so important because like in that refinery headline, like I, yes, I hear you. <laughs> and I love it because like we, I had to do the, I had to do the same research of trying to figure out like who were the people before me that took a maternity leave when they were a public company CEO. And like, I mean, you can do the math. If I was the youngest female founder and I'm 35, like, you know, there's not going to be a lot of other examples out there who, of people who face that. And so there's not a lot of precedent. And, um, and so, you know, as like somebody who now is raising young people and is thinking about like how the world that you see impacts who people become, um, like there's just not, there aren't great examples. And so um, even if it's just like, I'm just an example, like I think it's good and I'm happy to be that example. Um, and like I said, you know, I hope there's gonna be many more people after me that, um, you know, can, figure can you know be it's totally normal for like there's just these weird conversations around like well what do you do with earnings when you're on maternity leave and you're a public company CEO there are all these things that like I don't really know what the right answers are and you know I'm going to try to figure it out um but there just need to be more um I think just having more examples of what you know different types of stories look like and different possibilities look like is super important and so you know I I still probably don't want to be like pigeonholed is that's the only reason I'm that Stitch Fix is interesting. But, um, but at the same time, you know, I think I, you know, I embrace the 
role that I have in um, in being an example where there aren't a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those sort of can't win situations in some ways, right? Because like Marissa Meyer got dinged for only taking a couple of weeks of maternity leave, and you're probably going to get dinged for taking the entire maternity leave. I mean, it's like well, and these situations are all really different because yeah. you know I think Mar when Marissa was when Marissa Meyer was in her place, like I think she had like activist shareholder issues. She had you know like she had a company on fire situation, and so you know was that the right thing to do when your company is on fire? And this is the problem is that there's there's so few examples that like you know it's it's hard to like I was with actually I was with a public company CEO literally last week who he has a six week old at home and he is taking his paternity leave and so he was like ha happy to meet me at, at brunch like wearing like golf clothes and shorts <laughs> and, um, and he was on his paternity leave. Yeah. So like, you know, I think all of these situations are unique and, you know, it's, it's, you can't fault, I think one person for having, for having a different choice, but you know, the challenge is that there's really only two situations now that you're going to be able to look back on. And, you know, if, I think for many other men, there's hundreds. So, um, you know, hopefully this can add to what people think of as, you know, what are my options when I'm in this situation? Yeah. I mean, you're creating an entirely new framework. Right. I mean, that's it just because we've ex it's been one way for so long <laughs> but some 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 things are going to have to change. Um, so what um, where, where is your husband in all this? Does he like it used to be like I remember, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, like Carly Fiorina, like, you know, maybe it was even longer. I don't remember. I'm getting I'm even older than you. But when she was running HP, the whole story was about how her husband was at home taking care of the baby. And that's how it made it. They made it possible because they inverse the typical relationship. So do you and your hubby ever talk about, you know, divvying up the responsibilities so you can both do your thing? Yeah, I mean, we de you know, we definitely do. And he's not, you know, he's not at home taking care of the kids as his job full time. That's not um, like we have a nanny and she's wonderful. And so, um, but that being said, like, you know, and I think to myself, like, am I being sexist and thinking this? Because like, it's less about this year. Like I travel quite a bit, but as I think about next year and I think about we're going to have two kids and one's going to be a toddler and one will be an infant. And like, and you know, I, and I have this like enormous guilt around like, oh, that seems really hard. <laughs> and for me to be traveling and leaving him to deal with two kids at night, even if he's not taking care of them during the day, like it's a lot of work at nights and the mornings. And, um, and I would like think to myself, like, am I sexist in thinking that? Because there's m many, many men before me that had <laughs> wives that traveled and left their two <clears throat> kids with their wife and probably didn't think twice about it. And and I still like, I, I still haven't figured out like, how are we going to do that next year? Um, and so, you know, I think I'm very, very lucky and grateful that I have a husband that's very supportive and a husband that, you know, probably takes more of the mornings and nights than I do. Um, but, um, but I do, and I do think like in this world, like it does take, you know, it, it does take somebody who is willing to kind of put in, you know, a little bit more, I think to, and, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that you need somebody who's going to be like a complete, you know, kind of stay home parent or anything. But, um, but I do think like the reality is that it's hard. And, you know, the reality is like there's sacrifices that one or the other is going to be making every single day. Um, and then just, you know, trying to figure out how you can do that and then have a healthy relationship with your kids and a healthy relationship with your spouse. And, you know, it's all puzzle pieces that aren't super easy. Yeah. Well, it's all, I mean, it takes, it takes a village. <laughs> it takes teamwork. Um, so we're going to go to questions in about five minutes. So if you have some, you can start lining up. There's a microphone back there. Um, we'd love to hear from the audience. And that is true actually about the village. Now I'm looking at my sister who does a lot of babysitting for us. So hey, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's talk, let's talk about your team and, you know, and, and how you are, how the values that you're espousing are playing out inside your company around diversity. So your executive team is 50, 50 men and women. I did, I actually went to your website and I counted and it's true. <laughs> it really is true. Um, but most of your on the ground employees are women. And, um, I think 86%, is that about if right? If you include, yeah, the number's a little hard because if we have a 3,500 stylist organization and the vast majority of our stylists are women. So, um, these are women who are working part-time, mostly work from home. And so that skews the number to make it 80, 80 something overall company wide. But then we also have 1500 warehouses where it's about 50, 50, our headquarters, I think is about 60, 40 women to men. Um, so if you, if you put in the 3,500 stylists into our 6,000 employee figure, then it becomes very skewed sounding, but on average, it's about like, you know, it's a little over parity where we have women a little more represented than men. 
Well, one of the things I've been thinking about is like, we already know what the downsides are of a, of a, a culture dominated by men. And so <laughs> I've just been thinking about, well, what happens when you have a company that's kind of dominated by women? Like what, you know, what's the outcome there? I mean, firstly, like I would contest that it's like a culture dominated by women. It's like you know, our our board, our management team is fifty fifty. Our board is sixty forty women. Our headquarters is sixty forty women. Like, I don't think that's dominated by women, and I don't think that you would ask a male CEO who is progressive enough to have a you know, 40% fe or 50% female management team, like you would never ask him about a culture that's dominated by men. And so I think it's, like, I might now, I might now, <laughs> I mean, maybe not five years ago, but now I definitely would. I'm, you know, I'm just curious. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what your situation is, but just sort of philosophically speaking, you know, if there's any sort of upsides or downsides to having, well, even just having it at 50, 50, is in a sense more dominated by women than it has been in the in the past. Yeah, oh, unquestionably, it is more so. Um, but you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think the downside is that I get questions like that, not in an insulting way, but in a way that like it's not obvious to other people. Like yeah. that it's not something people are experiencing all the time, so it becomes something that is unusual. And like you know, I think that's unfortunate because yeah. like. I think there's a lot of upside to it. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of upside to it from just like having different perspectives and diversity. I think there's also, I mean, we were just talking about parenting, so it's top of mind for me. I think there's also a lot of upside from the perspective of people who are men and women who are, you know, trying to live a life and work. And, um, and you know, I think there's a lot more conversations and there's a lot more um, kind of empathy that happens when you see both sides of the equation every day at work. Um, so, you know, I... I don't know. I think it's also maybe all I know. So maybe I, I can't speak to the downsides or the upsides, but, um, you know, I think we, I think we've been able to create a place that people love to work and that, um, you know, has been able to take, you know, kind of this, what people academically talk about as being important in diversity and actually show like, this is what it looks like and this is how it works. And this is an example of it in a way that I don't know that we've seen, had a lot of examples before. Yeah. Well, k kudos to you for doing that because I know that takes a lot of effort. <laughs> All right. It looks like we do have some questions. Uh, first up, what Hi, is Katrina, your question? Thank you for being here. I'm Emily McDonald with the Stylist LA. And my question revolves around your experience with fundraising, because I know you said, I love how you said it, that it was either really easy or really hard. Can you talk a little bit about how you found the people that were the right fit that made it easy and how you also dealt with how difficult it was as well? Because I know, obviously, it's an important part of building the business. You had to do it. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, so let's see. So how did I find people? Um, the people who actually invested. So early, let's see. So early I kind of, with Steve, I got introduced to him through Sukinder, who I knew. So I do think like the highest quality people are people that somehow you can get introduced credibly through. And actually other founders is probably the best just because um, that's like a great pipeline for VCs. And so having kind of warm connections to VCs through other successful founders, I think is a very successful path to get there. Um, but to be honest, like it's not like that worked for me all that much. Like I had a spreadsheet of, you know, 50 or 60 investors most of whom said no. Um, and so it's not kind of a surefire way, but it definitely is a way you can build some trust. Um, in the case of Bill Gurley from Benchmark, he actually found us. And so we, we had got, I had gotten to a point where I'd more or less given up on fundraising and had decided, you know, I'm going to build a company that's sustainable, that doesn't need to raise money. And, um, and then Bill actually had heard from, he's like, all the women in my life are spending all their money on Uber and Stitch Fix. And I need to like learn what this Stitch Fix thing is. <laughs> and, um, and that's kind of how he got, he came to me. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have great advice on the topic. Like, you know, as I said, I don't know that I was terribly good at this, but, um, but, you know, I think that, you know, trying to figure out, and maybe the one tip I would say I would have is just, uh, you know, there, with Bill, actually, I did kind of keep in touch with him. And so we weren't, when I first met with him, we really weren't raising money or didn't want to raise money. But um, but I knew that if we wanted to, he, he seemed great. And so um, him and two other investors, actually, I would send kind of like a monthly update of just like, here are some things that are new in the business. Here's how some metrics moved. And like, the good thing is you kind of help investors connect the dots. And so, you know, even if he's ignoring the email or didn't always read it or didn't always respond, at least like I'm creating pattern recognition. So he actually ultimately came to us and was like, Hey, I really want to invest. Like, let's figure out how to make that happen. So, um, that's the very little advice I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Next. Hi there. I'm curious to know how you vet the clothing that you sell. 
Are you wooed by the gaps of the world or do you seek out small entrepreneurs? Yeah, we, um, not necessarily gap, but we definitely do a range. And so we have, um, you know, we have some brands, especially on the higher end, like um, Diane von Furstenberg or Joie or brands that kind of people already know and love. Um, and then we do have um, a, like a lot of entrepreneurial brands. I think we work with over 600 brands. And so um, there's a pretty broad range of people that we work with. Um, but Gap, for example, is a vertical retailer. J, J. Crew is a vertical retailer. So those kind of standalone brands wouldn't be ones that you'd find in our assortment. Hey there, my name is Ivana. Uh, I'm just curious to hear your perspective on how the experience of shopping in store is going to change now that so many retailers are closing their stores. What do you think the future looks like? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I mean, you know, I, I don't think stores will go away. I just think that stores really have to have a different reason for being than just a transaction. And historically, stores just served as a place for transactions, kind of like going to a Walgreens. You're like, I need dish soap. And you walk into a Walgreens and you pick up the dish soap and you leave. And um, and for clothing, it's, I just don't know that that's going to keep working. Um, and so I think there needs to be some kind of other value add. And um, I think different stores will have probably different reasons for that. But like, if you think about like a Nike town, which is super experiential or an Apple, which is basically a place where you can get customer support and connect other places where you can connect with the community. Like, you know, I think that what we, what we'll see is an evolution of brick and mortar being not just about a transaction, but about, you know, what other value are you adding to the experience or the customer? And, um, and I think, you know, we'll see some creativity in what that looks like. So, you know, I definitely think there is a future for stores. I just think they're going to look probably a little different than they have historically. Hi, Katrina. My name is Cortland Alves. I'm on the board of Inform. What advice would you have for a man on his company's leadership team? For a man on his company's leadership team? <laughs> I mean, I think it's the same <laughs> advice I have. I, I, you know, I think that there is, it's actually funny because I was on a panel where it was a bunch of, um, well, there are two women and one man, and he was like, he was kind of like, I feel kind of guilty for being like the man who runs a company. And I mean, there's no reason to, I think, you know, all of us women and men can create cultures where, um, where everybody is valued and where, you know, people can succeed and, um, and, you know, where like we can talk about diversity and inclusion in a way that, um, that maybe we haven't in decades before. And, you know, I think all of us have a great responsibility to create, um, you know, I think it's easier for me as a parent now to think about it because like, I can think about, um, like what kind of companies I would want my son to work for. And, you know, I would want him to be able to work at a place where he's respected, where he has opportunities, where he, um, like you can think of the things that you would want for your own child. And I feel a great responsibility to create a company and a culture um, that represents those things. And I think all of us men and women can do that. We have time for two more questions. Hi, Katrina. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, my name is Vanessa. Just had um, two, actually, I have two questions, if that's OK. okay. Um, so the first one is, I know part of Stitch Fix's success was being able to bring on a lot of great executives very early on. So can you talk a little bit about how you were able to attract them? And then the second thing is about the petite market. I feel like there's, a, there's been a huge boom in the plus size market. <laughs> um, do you think something similar will be happening in the petite market? in the next couple of years. Um, I'll, I'll take the petite one first. I'm also, I'm like five foot two. So also, uh, and we, and at Stitch Fix, we actually, so it's interesting. I mean, we, we do a good job at it and I think we can do a better job, but for example, one super interesting thing, and actually the men's market is even more interesting, but, um, with jeans, like it's, I mean, all, all of us who are, you know, a, five foot two or whatever, like, exactly, yeah, know that, like, <laughs> jeans are sold in, like, a 32-inch inseam. If you're lucky, you can maybe get them in a 30-inch inseam, and I'm, like, a 28-inch inseam. And so um, it's it's crazy, but denim manufacturers didn't do that. And it, Stitch Fix, we actually have them. We have 24 inch inseams. Like we have denim cut to the inseam, and and especially like distressing was in last season. And like the if if you buy distressed jeans that are a 32 inch inseam, like the knee distressing on me is going to be like, here, right? <laughs> like it makes no sense. And so, but it's like a fascinating thing with women. It was kind of obvious and easy to get vendors like, oh yeah, sure. Like they, they basically were department stores had a hard time buying those because they didn't know how many of their customers were petite, right? Like everybody's buying the 32. So they have no idea what percent of people are hemming it and not. And we actually knew, so we could tell them, please make this number of all the inseams. And that was easy on the women's side. 
What's really interesting is men also have the same problem. Like there are tons of men who are better off with a 30 inch inseam or a 31 inch inseam and not the 34 inch inseam that is normal in men's. And so now we're actually doing the same thing. And that's actually been more challenging because men's vendors like more or less had no idea. And like, <laughs> so anyway, so it, it is an opportunity. I don't know that it will be like, you know, kind of as, as much in the flourishing as, as plus size, just because plus size truly had nothing to start with. And, you know, I think with petite, at least we had a little bit to work with. And so, um, but definitely try the jeans at Stitch Fix. And if you have men who are not a 34 inch inseam in your life, which is probably most of you, um, you should also send them to Stitch Fix. <laughs> um, and kids are coming soon, right? Like yes, really petite. kids are coming soon too. Yes, our, <laughs> our tiniest clients. Um, your, uh, your other question on building teams, you know, I think my advice on that is just to be like as shaped shameless and like embrace rejection as you can. And like I met with, yeah, I had a list of just like people I'd love to meet. And like, for example, Reed, Hast Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, he's been on my list of people I'd love to meet for seven years. And I finally got to meet him this year and he emailed me He's hopefully he won't be embarrassed that I share this, but he emailed me being like, hey, I happen to be free on New Year's Day. Do you want do you want to hang out? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and, um, and so, like, you know, if you can be persistent enough, you can get to people and to be able to, um, you know, I, I, Eric, who runs our data science team, like he um, he was somebody that I just wanted to meet. Like, I didn't care where it led. I didn't care if he was going to have one meeting with me or like be open to another. But he was somebody who I convinced to join as an advisor um, and you know he was very happily at Netflix at the time and then um, I as an advisor he was spending you know one meeting a month with us and I would send him data I would send him updates and he he was like at one point he was like can I have a stitch fix email address and then he was like can I get some periodic data dumps so I can play with the data and then at one point he was like I feel like I shouldn't be doing this on my Netflix machine so can you get me a stitch fix machine and it was just this like <laughs> gradual reeling in <laughs> <laughs> that um, that ultimately, like, I had no aspiration. I couldn't have even fathomed, like, he was running all of data science at Netflix. Like, you just couldn't have even believed or told yourself to believe that he would someday join your team. Um, but if you just, like, surround yourself with the most talented people you possibly can and, um, and you know, figure out how you can get them to add more and more value, like, and, you know, I think it's just, like, and you just have to be shameless. Like, you know, you, Reed, Reed's told me like a hundred times that he doesn't want to meet up and <laughs> offers me some small slice of time and I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to take it. So I think um, that, uh, yeah, I think that's some of the advice. Hello. Um, I actually have a question about sustainability. So over the past couple of years, I've seen there's been a huge increase in sustainability initiatives within the fashion industry from an environmental and labor impact. And I was wondering if that's currently a hurdle for Stitch Fix or do you think it will be in the future and you might have to alter your business model because of it? Yeah, I think, I mean, right now we, we absolutely hold our vendors accountable to, um, to standards around what we expect in their workplaces and what we expect in their supply chain. And so, you know, we absolutely adhere to what I would call industry standards. You know, I think what's very different about our philosophy on this is like where I'm most focused is on waste, on kind of waste in the supply chain. And so, um, you know, I think it's really sad that, um, and this is actually goes back to the cheap dress and dress on sale example. Like, you know, I think the world and consumers have gotten to a place where like there's just excess consumption and ex you know and it's all driven by sales and discounts and whatever and at the end of the day at Stitch Fix like our philosophy is like we want to build more of what people love and get it to what so we want to buy we, we want to be creating more and more of the things that we know are going to have happy homes and less and less of the things that don't and so in the broader fashion industry and especially at the higher ends a lot of times when product um, when product goes unsold in a season it gets burned or destroyed um, and that's like public knowledge. People know this. And, um, and, and, you know, I think because things have, be, have been so cheap to make, like there's been no disincentive against that. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we're very thoughtful about, like how can we prevent that? And so in our model, um, we have much less product that ends up, we don't disclose exactly what it is, but we have much less product that ends up being out of season. And actually what I talked about with inseams is a good example of why. Because in a regular store, you have no idea who's going to walk in and what they're going to buy. And in our model, we know what percentage of our clients are petite. We know what percent of our clients hate red. So all those things, help to make us 
make the right decision in the first place so that at the end of the season we have less of that kind of product that didn't find a happy home. And the product that didn't, we actually work it through. We have um, third parties that work it through who resell it. We have we actually do quite a bit of donation, product donation through it. And then, um, and then the third bucket we have through employee sales in our warehouses. Um, but our goal is to make that as less, as little as possible so that, you know, not only can we feel like we are building a supply chain that is healthy, but also we aren't creating more product than the world needs. Um, and so, you know, I think we think we through our business practices that we can improve that. All right, great questions. Thank you, everybody. All right, I have one last question for you, which is an informed tradition, which is, no pressure, what is your 60-second idea to change the world? <laughs> um, I don't know that I have a specific idea, but like I think that one of the things that has been um, a real challenge, and you can see it in the kind of political landscape also is just in the loss of community. And so I think even just like this group of people getting together to do something like this in an evening is a really great part of that. Um, and I think there's been like a, you know, just kind of a lack of a loss of humanization of a lot of the things that we do. And so, you know, when we're buying things, when we're, um, the way that we engage with each other, like a lot of it has been kind of dehumanized in a way that I think has taken away from communities. And so, you know, I don't know what the exact idea is, but ways that you can bring more commerce into the communities, ways that you can um, make things like buying clothes a more human experience and a more human to human experience, I think brings back the humanness that connects us as a country and as a community. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of, especially in e-commerce, it's become very anonymous and very transactional. And, um, and I think that the, you know, the harms of that are greater than what we're seeing in terms of the impact that it's having on how we think about each other and how we think about the space that we occupy together. So, um, so I'd love to see anything that kind of just brings back a sense of community and brings communities together in more human ways. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you. <laughs>